Welcome, everyone. Um, just a couple of uh, notes. If you're not on the committee or a speaker, please mute your microphone and turn off your video to save bandwidth uh, for this call. Our committee's objective remains to gather experts from business, labor, academia, and government to examine deeply the complicated system that moves physical goods from manufacturing locations around the world, including increasingly here in the US, to homes, businesses, governments, and nonprofits across our nation. We're working to characterize the system, to reduce its variability, and to decide where we want the bottlenecks to be. And we're proposing changes for government and industry that will allow us to increase supply chain performance and resilience. In our last meeting on February 3rd, we agreed to continue to refine the recommendations we prioritized, working with our partners in the Department of Commerce and the federal government more broadly to flesh out a focused set of actions. We look forward today to the updates from our terrific subcommittee leaders, Stu Pan, Gene Soroka, and Revathy Advaithi. So Ursula and I would like to uh, turn it over to our speakers. We have a, a great set of speakers today. Uh, it's my honor to introduce Nima Singh Guliani, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Services. In this role, she directs the U.S. Department of Commerce's efforts to create the policy conditions for U.S. digital, financial, supply chain, and other service industries to compete around the world. Guliani is a lawyer and policy expert who has worked on issues at the intersection of national security, economics, and civil rights. Before joining ITA, she served at Twitter as head of national security, democracy, and civil rights public policy for the Americas, where she led development of policy and strategy in the US for surveillance, the open internet, and civil rights. Guliani has a, a JD from Harvard Law and a Bachelor of Arts in International Relations with a focus on global security from Brown University. Welcome Deputy Assistant Secretary Nima. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff, for that very, very kind introduction. Um, as Jeff mentioned, I lead um, the services team here at the International Trade Administration, and that includes the Office of Supply Chain and Professional Business Services, um, which is the team that manages this committee. So I just want to start by first thanking everybody um, on the committee and also the staff for all of the hard work um, that went into these meetings today um, and all the work that's gone on for the last several months in developing and refining the recommendations. Um, I also want to welcome our new committee member, um, Joseph Gasparov. Um, Joe um, is, the new is the new president of International Longshore and Warehouse Union Local 63. He has over 35 years of port labor experience, um, and I think he'll have very valuable insights to share with our committee. Um, Joe, thank you so much for being here. Um, we very much look forward to working with you in the coming months. Um, I also want to take a moment um, to, to talk about Mike Odu, um, who precedes Joe. Um, he's also of the ILWU. Um, thank you, Mike, so much for all of the work um, that you've put into this committee um, and the many insights you've contributed over um, the, the time of your service. Um, today, I'm very lucky and pleased to be joined by Assistant Secretary Harris, Deputy Undersecretary Farrell, um, and of course, Secretary Raimondo, who will um, speak with us shortly. Um, also, we will have um, members of the National um, Economic um, Council, um, Director Brainerd and Monica Gorman, um, as well as Undersecretary Crane from the Department of Energy. Um, so looking forward to, to hearing them speak later today. Um, from all of them, I think you'll hear the same oh. message. You hear how important um, the work of this committee is, how committed and dedicated we are to strengthening um, supply chains and resiliency overall. Um, you also get a little bit more insight into progress we've made related to many of the recommendations you all have had, as well as priorities going forward. Um, and so with that, I'll just say thank you once again, and I'll turn this meeting back over to Ursula and Jeff to introduce our next speaker, Assistant Secretary Harris. Well, thank you, Deputy Assistant Secretary Guliani. Um, now I'd like to introduce Grant T. Harris, who is the Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Industry and Analysis. Grant was appointed by President Biden, confirmed by the U.S. Senate on April 7, 2022, and officially sworn in on April 19, 2022. He leads a staff of more than 225 trade and industry experts that produce innovative, high-quality, in-depth trade analysis 
and develop strategies to maintain the leading competitive edge of American industry throughout the world. Harris has 20 years of private and public sector experience related to international relations, national security, and global business. He holds a law degree from Yale Law School, a master's in public affairs with distinction from Princeton University, and a Bachelor of Arts from the University of California, Berkeley. It's my pleasure to introduce Grant Harris. Thank you, Jeff. I really appreciate it. Thank you to you, Jeff and, and Ursula, for your leadership and guidance for the ACSCC overall. And, and thank you also to our dedicated chairs for the subcommittees as well, Ravathy, Stu, and Jean, and to all of the members, we really appreciate the work that this takes for this important form of service and for the dedication and the commitment that you show day in and day out. As Nima and other colleagues have made clear at each point, we take your recommendations deeply seriously. Most importantly, the secretary takes them incredibly seriously and shares them with colleagues with the White House and with other departments and agencies as well. In the interim period since we've last met as a full group, I had the pleasure of meeting with each of the three subcommittees in July, and I was really impressed by the dynamism and by the work that's being discussed there. I was able to share on my end some updates, including how we're working to implement the many of the June 2022 recommendations. I was joined also by Dr. Monica Gorman of the National Economic Council, who joined for two of those subcommittee meetings and was able to provide an update from her perspective as well. And we're lucky to have her on the agenda today, in addition to Dr. Brainerd, the director of the National Economic Council. And in those subcommittee meetings, we were also able to talk a little bit about industry and analysis new, industry and analysis new supply chain center and some of the work that we have planned. I was also able to hear your views on how the committee can be better administered and how we can make these interactions as dynamic and as productive as possible. We're really committed to following up on those ideas. They're ones that we've discussed further internally after hearing them. They're ones that we really want to operationalize with you and make sure that you feel the impact of all of your time and all of your recommendations for this service. Uh, one other piece that I wanted to provide a little bit more context on as we've been talking about this, and I think, and I hope that we'll be talking about it more today and in the weeks and months to come, is some of the work that is emanating from this industry and analysis business unit here at Commerce at the direction of the secretary to create a supply chain center and to expand the work that we do. As many of you know, we've been working on supply chains from the Department of Commerce for years. But we have also, particularly with your guidance and your recommendations, been very focused on how to make our work more proactive, even as we improve our speed and capabilities with respect to reactive supply chain work and responding to acute shortages and disruptions. And we also want to continue to make strides in leveraging big data and making our analysis as rigorous as possible, both from a qualitative, but also a quantitative perspective. And these are ways that in the subcommittees, there seem to be interest and there certainly is strong interest on our side on making sure that this can be one of several things that we could discuss in more detail and get more feedback on and get more specific ideas and recommendations on about how to make this work as effective as possible. We also spoke in the subcommittees about the exciting progress that we've seen on the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity. And in light of the feedback on that and the questions and the comments and the encouragement, we wanted to make sure that that was also a specific agenda item uh, for today in response to your request to make it such and to provide a speaker. And we've got Sharon Yuan, who's our chief negotiator for IPEF, who will provide some perspective. And I suspect without preempting the secretary's remarks that she may mention this as well. And so I'm really looking forward to identifying these ways that we can get very specific and concrete feedback and advice that we can also engage in a dynamic way in the subcommittees and make sure that we're offering uh, the speakers and the content that you would find most useful and for you to be able to uh, provide real-time uh, engagement as well on these key issues and to respond to the priorities that you're setting. We're very excited about the ongoing work. It's always hard to convey in a Zoom call to tell you that we feel excited, but it's true, this is a very important FACA, a very important source of advice, and it's one that we want to make sure that we remain deeply, deeply engaged with. 
we've got a few minutes before the secretary joins. And so I wanted to, to pause and, and see Jeff, if there were any questions or comments on anything that I'd said, or, or if you or Ursula wanted to chime in. I'll just add my welcome to all of the people on the phone and thanks to the subcommittees, their leads, their members, and to Commerce and all of the other departments in the US government that have been supportive of this effort. It's been fun and frustrating, which is the two things that you should have on every conversation with government fun. And, uh, and it's been informative as well. And I think we've made a lot of progress. So thank you, Grant and, and Jeff, my Chairman, thank you so much. And I would just add, um, while we're waiting, um, uh, my thanks too to all of the subcommittees for their hard work. Um, over the past year, we've moved from a very broad and large set of recommendations, some general, some very specific, to a more focused set that I think uh, lead, will be more likely to lead to real action um, for, for our nation. Um, Grant, you just mentioned the analytical focus of, of your and other areas of the Department of Commerce. And I'd, I'd like to applaud um, the department and Secretary Raimondo for supporting this approach. Um, I, I really do believe that the government having the analytical capability to be able to um, understand and characterize the whole state of our supply chain and know it well enough that when the next crisis occurs, the next time there's a bottleneck that we didn't anticipate, uh, you'll be, the government should be better informed by all of the work that you're doing now. And um, this is the kind of long-term leadership that I've come to um, expect from Secretary Mundo, and I'm really pleased to see uh, the continued support for uh, the approach that you're taking. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that, the, those kind words, and particularly the strong welcoming of this analytical capability that we're refining and augmenting. We've been doing a lot on supply chains, but I think as we've discussed here in this body, there is a strong need for an even deeper analytical engine to be as proactive as possible, as methodical as possible, and to be able to inform U.S. government work across the board about which supply chains to be prioritizing, where the greatest risk may lie, how to work most effectively with the private sector in improving resiliency, and to address many of the issues that, that you've raised in, in this group and elsewhere. And so thank you. It's a, a nascent effort in some regard in terms of taking it in that stronger direction, but it's building on years of working on these issues and the industry analysis that, that we've got here in industry and analysis. For those who haven't worked with us as a business unit, the thing that really makes us unique is that we have the broadest set of industry expertise across the US government. We cover 90% of GDP in the shop, and it's the only place where you have this unique commercial perspective and the understanding of upstream and downstream. We cover critical minerals to finished airplanes and everything in between. And so naturally in prior years, the as a de facto epicenter of supply chain work, you could see how that industry knowledge would be drawn on, but we want to make sure that we're institutionalizing and, and really making it as proactive as possible to build and make it stronger. And your advice will help us do that, including thinking about the data to be using, the areas of focus that we should be most uh, centered in on, and, and the other types of work that you all have done in your careers that we will learn a lot from. I know that we're just moments away from the secretary joining. If there are any other comments or questions, though, I'd be happy to take them. Well, suddenly this is a very shy group. <laughs> Willie, characteristically, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Looks like Willie has his hand up. Well, you you know that I'm never going to leave dead air like that. Uh, so, <laughs> one thing to just think about, uh, Grant, as you're collecting all this data, because I think it's a very important initiative. One thing to think about is how do you overcome the barriers associated with people saying, 
I want to hold this data proprietary. Okay. And, uh, you know, that could come from like pooling methods or things like that. We've seen that in other sectors, for example, retail point of sale data, you know, a lot of people consider that that that's proprietary. Okay. But in all these supply chain things, you know, just food for thought, something to think about what incentives you might have to put in there. Great. Well, it's an excellent question. I will try to do it justice, but for now, I'm, I know that Secretary Armando has joined it. So with your permission, I'll hold the content of that question and come back to it. Of course. And um, Secretary Armando, it's my honor and privilege to introduce you, a woman who needs no introduction to a group with whom you're quite familiar and who you've engaged in the past. And so I'll leave you to it because there's no point in me belaboring this. Thank you so much for joining. Sorry about that. Hi, everybody. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you to all of you for the work that you have been doing. Uh, I've had a chance to talk to a few of you one on one. And of course, I talk to Grant regularly uh, and Nellie Abernathy, who works for me, about the work you're doing. And I just want to thank you. Um, I should say that there's no shortage around the world of anyone who wants to talk to me about supply chains. <laughs> wherever I go, literally wherever I go, people want to know, um, what are we doing together to shore up supply chains? And so the work you're doing really matters so much. I have to, in addition to thanking Grant, of course, wanna thank the co-chairs, Ursula and Jeff. You guys have been great from day one and consistently focused on specific concrete things that we can do together. I'd like you to stay focused there, you know, concrete things, projects that we can get done. Uh, thank you to, to today's speakers and thank you to our newest member, Joe. Thank you for joining us. But um, the truth of it is, you know, Friday, I was with the president at Camp David with Prime Minister Kashida and President Yoon. Supply chain resiliency uh, occupied a lot of the meeting. Uh, next week, I'm trotting off to China. We will uh, talk about the supply chains there. When we had Prime Minister Modi visit a month or so ago, huge focus on supply chains. I just think that due to COVID, primarily, uh, the world's eyes are opened to the challenges and vulnerabilities that we have when we have a non-resilient overly concentrated supply chain, but also the opportunity. And that's where you come in, you know, the opportunity and the mandate to focus on proactive supply chain efforts that will uh, help business enhance our national security and the United States economic competitiveness. So uh, that is something that I think we can all agree is very important. Uh, Another initiative, two quick initiatives I want to put on your radar. Uh, one is the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which we launched just over a year ago, which has a supply chain component to it. Uh, I'm spending a lot of time thinking about how do we work with Vietnam, Indonesia, the Philippines, uh, the countries in that region to work with them to make our supply chains more resilient and would welcome your thoughts on that work. And then secondly, I mentioned Prime Minister Modi earlier, and I've spoken with a few of you guys about this, but I am especially interested in your recommendations on how we can support US companies' efforts to uh, diversify their supply chain by maybe not just being so concentrated in China or not just being so concentrated in one country in Asia and instead looking to India as well as Indonesia, Vietnam and other areas of the Indo-Pacific. That's a specific area of focus for me, the priority of the presidents. I have a lot of interest in the private sector and I would ask you, you know, how, how can we do that? If a U.S. company calls me and says, Gina, uh, we, we want to think about diversifying somewhat a way, you know, and then this isn't about China specifically, 
but it's about concentration in any one country. How do we diversify? And increasingly, India, Vietnam are going to the top of their list. And I'd like to know your advice about how we work to enhance supply chain resilience across a range of sectors in which those countries in the Indo-Pacific could serve as a partner. Um, I also wanted to let you know that under Grant Harris's leadership, we are developing a supply chain resilience team here at the Department of Commerce uh, housed in Grant's shop. So we're building a first of its kind supply chain center to be the analytic engine uh, to inform US government decision-making. I mean, I just want you to pause for a second. Think about what I just said and how crazy of a statement that is. On the one hand, it's a great credit to the president's leadership and Grant's leadership that we are going to have a first of its kind supply chain center. On the other hand, it's a little crazy that the United States government doesn't have that already. And so I would appreciate your recommendations on how we best leverage advanced analytics, um, predictive software, quantitative data, so that we can be more nimble in predicting emerging risk, assessing risk, and identifying a core set of critical vulnerable sectors and then secure the data that we need to analyze them. I'm pushing the team um, to have a proactive approach. Right now, most of what we in the government do around supply chain is reactive. Baby formula crisis, semiconductor crisis, we react. I want to get into the business so that the United States government has a permanent analytical operation to get into the predictive and proactive business so we can be um, the most impactful. So in any event, that's just a flavor of what we are working on and where I could really use your help. And again, you know, just wanna say thank you for dedicating so much time and effort to the work of this um, committee. Great, thank you so much, Madam Secretary. I know that there'll be a lot of great comments and questions in response to what you have to say. Jeff and, and Ursula, I'll turn it over to you to moderate this, or I'm happy to as well. Uh, if we would, if we want to just go straight into the next speaker, or do you want some questions for the secretary? I, I know that we had uh, blocked a little bit of time on her schedule as, as she's getting ready for a trip. She doesn't have a lot, but she does have time for a couple of questions. And yeah, let's, so I, I or if you don't need me. Fire okay. away. Now's no, your no, chance. No, we want to. We want to. <laughs> Why don't we open it up for some questions from the floor for the secretary? Rainer has his hand up. Secretary Raimondo, good to see you and thanks for your comments and all the work you're doing. Um, India, big, big topic. And uh, we as a company and I'm, much of our industry are, are, you know, increasing investments in India for supply chain resiliency, of course, and also to create a bit of a hedge uh, to, you know, other large manufacturing nations out there. Um, and, you know, manufacturing uh, in India, as you likely uh, know, is, is fraught with complexity uh, throughout uh, the subcontinent. And those are things that can be worked on, and I know they're on the agenda. But as important as the supply chain opportunity that India provides is the potential demand of that market for the shorter and the longer term to really provide uh, with the large educated population that exists there a true alternative and a new growth vector for our economy overall. So with that sort of preamble, um, how are we thinking about at Commerce the demand opportunity of India alongside of the supply opportunity that it represents. Thank, um, you. thank you, Rainer, and, and nice to see you as always. So two, two quick comments. One, um, I don't think there's been as much focus on that as there probably should be. So I would welcome your views and I'll ask my team to think about it more. I mean, candidly, the average income in India is still quite low. I know there's a billion four people um, most of whom still you know, live in poverty or very nearly so. 
having said that, uh, and so as a result, we've been more focused on the on the um, supply chain aspect of it. I will say that we are, I help companies and I will help you and any companies here trying to access the Indian market. So particularly for payments, credit products, uh, uh, certain other kinds of consumer goods, we see an opportunity. I know Walmart, for example, has found huge opportunity in India and we've been very helpful uh, with them. So I think at the right price point and the right product, there is a big opportunity and we want to be helpful with that. The opportunity that I am just getting a lot of demand and Ravathi, who's part of this committee is front and center on this. U.S. manufacturing companies, U.S. industrial companies, including and especially in the electronics supply chain, are looking for alternatives. They realize they're massively concentrated in China and Taiwan and, and they want alternatives. And India is increasingly at the top of their list. So what I'm trying to do is figure out, okay, what do we have to do to enable that? What investments does India have to make? What changes in the regulatory environment do they have to make? What does the infrastructure have to look like? And that's why we're working it at a government to government level. Thank you. I think Gene has his hand up. Thanks, Ursula. And uh, Secretary, thanks very much. On the three points that you just raised, the two parts of common ground that India and Vietnam share a lack of infrastructure. India, we talk about on a regular basis, big country, middle class, larger than the population of the United States. But it's difficult to move in and out from suburban Loni outside of Delhi to Mundra and Mumbai ports, et cetera. So that, con that constant investment in infrastructure that can be resilient through monsoon season and other uh, other natural effects are gonna be key. In Vietnam's perspective, it's kind of a hodgepodge where the manufacturing center in Ho Chi Minh has no real connectivity to the Kai Mep port area in the Mekong Delta. You've got river ports like Hai Phung to the north. So again, infrastructure investment is key to be able to manufacture resilient supply chains, air, land, and ocean. Uh, lastly, on the... Um, on the analytics side, Grant took the time to meet with our freight subcommittee last month, as he mentioned in his opening comments, to talk about this house of institutional knowledge that's being created. Fantastic. I would ask that coordination continues across other agencies in Washington, as some from the outside may see a little bit of overlap or competing interests. So clearly defined roles and responsibilities would be great, but uh, really applaud the efforts here. Uh, the work in China going forward, one other uh, piece for you, the wholly foreign-owned enterprise license that seems to be limited in its use today for American companies, spans back about 35 years and maybe something that you want to uh, look into a little bit with those who are continuing their supply chain work in, uh, in mainland China. That's a great flag. Thank you, Gene. Donald, I think your hand is up. It is, thank you. Secretary Armando, thank you very much. Uh, we applaud the effort to look at other countries, if you will, and reduce our dependency on you know, a couple of three uh, coming out of the East. My question is this, as we take a look at diversifying our sourcing, are there opportunities for your team to be engaged with different companies to help us understand what capabilities that they may have and their appetite uh, to partner slash do business with us so that we can start looking at those countries as avenues perhaps that we had not thought about before? Uh, that's an excellent question. And uh, to be very candid, I think the answer is, is probably yes, but this would be something where if you and the committee could work with Grant, to tell us exactly like in what form could we give you that information so that it's most useful. I think for it to be most useful, we'd have to identify maybe like a narrow sector. Sure. Uh, real, get really granular. 
And if we could get really granular, like by sector, by country, or by subsector, by region, we would definitely um, like to do that. And yeah, quite frankly, I was thinking a little broader than even just my business because there are just so many sectors in the U.S. that could benefit from this type of effort. And so if companies or countries were able to highlight their capabilities, it may be an opportunity for us to somewhat pick and choose where we'd like to start negotiating and are investigating what capabilities they may have. So just a broader suggestion. Uh, obviously, we have a team that's working on something in a more narrow fashion, but just thinking about the broad economy. You know, one of the things we are going to do, this hasn't been announced yet, and we're working on it, is to have, in, in connection with the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, to have an annual, like, investor conference or investor summit, where we would do exactly what you're talking about, Donald. So highlight like a matchmaking function, you know, in the different countries in the Indo-Pacific and get U U.S. investors and industry connected to opportunities. Well, thank you, Secretary Mondo. And again, we appreciate your leadership. Thank you. I think I see Michael Mullins' uh, hand up. Am I right, Michael? Yes. Uh, yes, thanks very much, Ursula. And uh, uh, Madam Secretary, thanks again for uh, joining us today. I wanted to ask with your with your trip to China coming up, if maybe you could give us a sort of at a high level what what the message is that you might be taking over there. You know, I, I think a lot of us share the perception that while we have this long list of problems with China, that commerce has perhaps done a better job than other federal agencies and maintaining that perspective on how important China is to our economy and how that's going to continue in the future. So maybe if you could give us a uh, uh, a, a little glimpse of, uh, of what you might be uh, uh, focusing on on that trip. So maybe you could come with me, Michael, because what you just said is exact my exactly my focus. Uh, it's exactly that. You know, we have a very significant trading relationship with China, and that's good for China. That's good for America. Frankly, it's good for the world. You know, I think there's a demand signal from the rest of the world to the United States and China, that we need to find a way to coexist, trade, do business together, and ratchet down the conflict and turn down the temperature without ever compromising uh, American national security. So that's the message that I hope to take. It's really um, like I'm a practical person. It's like a practical message. Yes, we're in a fierce competition. Yes, we have national security priorities. We're going to protect our people. There are, however, a lot of lanes to do business, and we should do that. So you can, without saying you know too much, um, you can expect me to talk about uh, travel and tourism as a huge lane of opportunity that has nothing to do with our national security, that creates a lot of jobs and connects people, Chinese, you know, people to people connections, which I think are important. Um, th this is so many areas where we should do business. And then the last thing is I'm going to try to, if, and I hope I can be successful, open up some formal channels of communication. So that around commercial issues, you know, in my lane, commercial issues, so that there's a constant, transparency and dialogue so we can work through tough stuff when it comes up so there's left so there's not misunderstanding and so that it doesn't immediately escalate okay great sounds like a great approach i i, I wish you all the best on this trip thanks Thank i just you. have to avoid the mushrooms <laughs> <laughs> i know madam secretary that You've got to prepare for this trip in real time. We also have Dr. Brainerd, who's joined yes, as well. Yes. And we're excited for that. And so I, seeing as there are no other questions as well, and, and this is perfectly timed in terms of the schedule, we're hoping to turn this back over to Jeff and Ursula. And thank you again, Secretary Mondo, for your leadership here and for all the work that you're doing. Wonderful. You guys are the best. You're really adding a ton of value. And I'm so pleased that Lael is joining you. You are in for a treat. She's in it. She's exceptional. And uh, 
you know, is in the White House every day, uh, working with us and supporting us on supply chain work. So it's really important that she hears from you. Uh, just be upfront, be honest, and let us know what's going on on the ground. Anyway, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Secretary Raimondo. And now I'd like to introduce Lael Brainard, who is the director of the National Economic Council. When you hear her um, accomplishments, you'll be awed like I am. Director Brainard previously served as the vice chair of the Federal Reserve. She took office as a member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System in June of 2014 to fill an unexpected term, uh, vacancy, exp un unexpired, I'm sorry, term ending in January 31st, 2026. Prior to her appointment to the board, Dr. Brainard served as the Undersecretary of the U.S. Department of the Treasury from 2010 to 2013 and Counselor to the Secretary of the Treasury in 2009. Dr. Brainard received a BA with University Honors from Wesleyan University and uh, an MS and a PhD in economics from Harvard University, where she was awarded a National Science Foundation Fellowship. With no further, further ado, Dr. Brainerd. Well, thank you very much uh, for that uh, very kind introduction. It's really nice to see everybody. Um, and I uh, wanna thank you uh, very much for your service to this committee for the uh, very thoughtful contributions you've been making. It's really helped um, uh, Secretary Raimondo and her team uh, work on uh, this critical uh, supply chain issue. And it's also helped uh, inform us uh, in our work uh, at the White House and uh, across the interagency. So we uh, we work very much uh, with uh, Secretary Raimondo um, uh, on this issue, as well as the other agencies to ensure supply chain resilience as a whole of government effort. Um, and uh, this is an ongoing effort. Uh, you know, we had uh, some really notable uh, breakdowns uh, during the pandemic, but we uh, recognized as a result of that, that it's important to continue to build resilience um, and to uh, make sure that uh, for the next set of challenges that the economy faces, we're in a much better position. Um, I also will say that the, um, the new supply chain office at Commerce uh, brings really uh, important analytical capability um, to uh, the U.S. government overall and complements some investments that other agencies are making. So we really um, uh, are pleased about the development there. Obviously, uh, we did see uh, during the com combined on long duration of the pandemic and then the energy shock associated with Russia's war on Ukraine, um, it, it was uh, a real-time stress test of American supply chains, and they did not perform very well. Uh, we saw shortages uh, in a whole host of different goods, uh, and those shortages led to spiking inflation um, when uh, demand uh, was skewed <laughs> towards those same sectors. So we discovered, I think, that um, we needed to be more mindful about public sector um, uh, working uh, hand in glove with the private sector um, at the same time that the private sector is making tweaks to and rethinking some of the just-in-time practices as well as uh, concentration of parts of global supply chains in, in areas that may turn out to be uh, somewhat undependable. Um, we now, I think, um, with the historic legislation that the president secured, uh, feel like we have much better tools uh, to focus on addressing the supply side of our economy. Um, and we're seeing both in the semiconductor um, supply chain, as well as in the clean energy supply chain, um, as well as with our investments in broadband roads, rail, air, and ports, that these investments can uh, be greater than the sum of the parts in terms of building resilience and providing a really strong foundation on which the private sector can confidently uh, invest and expand. 
Um, and of course, uh, we're seeing the results of this uh, in the data now. You know, we have seen uh, there's a great index that the New York Fed um, has constructed. There are a number of different ways of gauging aggregate supply chain frictions, but I like that one in particular. Um, it has round tripped. Uh, it basically uh, finally has taken the full round trip, but it was several standard deviations above anything we had seen historically um, over the last few years. And it took a while for that to come down. Um, but what's interesting is that core goods inflation has tracked that index extremely closely. And so it has also uh, largely round trip. And of course, those aggregate indices reflect all the efforts of the companies um, that you all represent, um, and and so you know that I think um, is a, is a, a cause for some relief on our part, but not um, uh, uh, not an indication for us in uh, the Biden administration that we should. Uh, you know, sort of uh, lower our vigilance quite the reverse. I think we are continuing to work hard um, to ensure that that resilience is maintained. Um, in terms of the committee's recommendations, I think we saw 45 recommendations on manufacturing and freight coming out of this committee last year. I wanted to just speak to a few of them. I think you advised uh, that we should accelerate end-to-end -end supply chain data sharing. Um, and uh, we have now the Freight Logistics op Optimization Work Initiative, which um, we just call Flow, which is a forum and a platform for companies to share supply chain information and analytics with each other. It started out um, with 18 initial participants um, and quickly doubled to 36. Um, and uh, we are now working on creating a forward-looking integrated picture of supply chain conditions in the US. Um, and it's, it's a nice model of collaboration between government and industry. And as you know, we've had requests to, to, to share data and to uh, partner with uh, a variety of foreign countries um, in IPF and elsewhere on uh, supply chain resilience. Um, this committee also advised us to work with the Department of Labor to help employers create career paths um, and a communication strategy to highlight best practices in uh, these sectors. So we launched a roadmap to support good jobs, uh, which uh, provides a strategic framework to guide workforce development. Um, and we have now, starting in May, launched a set of workforce hubs in Phoenix, Columbus, Baltimore, Augusta, and Pittsburgh um, to partner with state and local officials, employers, unions, high schools, and community colleges to ensure that we have a great skilled and diverse uh, workforce that can access um, pathways to meet the demand for labor driven by the investments that we're making in chips and science, as well as the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, and uh, there is also a big effort underway to create more registered apprenticeships in these areas, including um, uh, competitive grants from uh, the Department of Labor. We've also seen uh, after a period of um, actually reduced uh, uh, levels of foreign-born working age population that actually predated the pandemic, um, we've seen that population on the rise again um, at a time where uh, more Americans uh, have jobs uh, than we've seen in 20 years. So the share of the uh, working age population that's employed is at a 20 year high, which is great. Um, and then I think the only last area I'll just uh, mention, but I'm happy to respond to any questions is an area um, that was also among your manufacturing recommendations where I feel like we've got a lot more work to do. And that is to leverage the FDA supply chain data um, to be able to expand US pharmaceutical supply chain resiliency. And I would say um, on that one, uh, we are early earlier stages, um, but we're starting to get the FDA and HHS to make the requisite um, investments in data and visibility. And we're hoping that over time, um, we'll be able to work with the private sector um, to anticipate and address um, potential shortages. Um, and of course, working also with Congress. So uh, those are just a few of the areas that we've been working on, but happy to talk with you about um, our broader agenda. Um, so let me pass it back to you, Ursula. 
Crystal, you're on mute. Sorry, I've done this for three years and I still do the same thing every time. Uh, I'll, I'll toss it over to Jeff, but um, we'll open it up for any questions while I'm doing that, that for Dr. Bernard. If there are any, if they're not, I have one for you, uh, Leo. Let me, let me take it. We've done a lot of work so far on, um, on chips, high-tech chips. Can you give us a, just a quick update on how, what the assessment is so far? Are we making progress not? Or is there anything else that we should be focusing on outside of the norm? Yeah, so um, I think uh, the chips team at uh, Commerce um, has, uh, I just met with a, a, a number of them yesterday. Um, and I know uh, Secretary Mundo is extremely focused on this. Um, we've got great applications in. Um, I think we could spend the chips money several times over. Um, and uh, it's it's very it's 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 actually very exciting to see the kinds of investments that companies want to make here in the US. Um, and we know that these um, are uh, very, uh, significant um, uh, investments uh, for companies to be making the scale of an investment needed um, for a new fab and for some of the um, integrated uh, activities that take place in and around a fab. Those are massive investments, very difficult for companies to make those. And so having the Chips and Science Act funding um, to help uh, provide some of that kind of risk capital, I think is extremely important here. Um, but, you know, the, the Chips and Science Act provides uh, significant government support, um, which we think is the right scale to be able to see a um, very significant amount of leading edge activity taking place in the United States. Um, and uh, the, the proposals that um, the Commerce Department is assessing we're not obviously part of that assessment process, um, but we uh, certainly have been, um, you know, sort of briefed on uh, the content of, you know, the proposals broadly. Uh, and, you know, they are uh, very well thought through proposals that will create a very significant amount of activity in the U.S. of precisely the mix um, that we think is important to increase supply chain resilience and, and create the capacity here in the U.S. that will um, protect us from the kind of uh, frictions and shortages that were so disruptive just two years ago. Um, and of course, we have uh, some of the biggest uh, user industries in the U.S. of, you know, chips of a whole variety of different types, including leading edge, but also current and mature. So having uh, that um, capacity here in the U.S. and uh, being able to have confidence about having some domestically located supply, I think is very important to those users. Um, so this is, this is a real game changer. Um, and it'll take a while because these uh, chip fabs are huge uh, and uh, are, are time consuming. But I think five years from now, our chip industry will be completely transformed as a result, including of the R&D funding that kind of goes alongside it and will help anchor the, the ecosystem. Wonderful, thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Bernard? Ursula, I'll go ahead and ask one. Um, Dr. Mm -hmm. Bernard, you know, one of the things um, we talked about was that you mentioned was about unemployment being, you know, at um, at an all time low and um, which is good for the country. We're also seeing all the investments associated with IRA that's building uh, manufacturing jobs across the country being a good thing. All that being said, it's really hard to grow, continue to grow an economy and create um, kind of good jobs if we don't have the right demographics to support it. So maybe you can help us talk, you know, through more about what can we do to continue to support the right development of skills across the country so we can make sure that the right kind of people are available for jobs across the U.S., which seems to be kind of the biggest, I'd say, roadblock now in terms of uh, developing new factories or creating more manufacturing jobs across the country, just finding skilled workers. 
Um, and I'm thinking more long term is how do you really build that presence um, and what are the right ways to do it? At the manufacturing subcommittee, we give a few recommendations around that, uh, but this is obviously a more long term focused effort that has to happen uh, to support this kind of growth. So I'd love to hear your thoughts around what more can we do? Yeah, so um, you're right that strategically, this is one of the most important things um, that we can do for our long-term productivity in the U.S. Um, and uh, to make sure that the U.S. has the capacity to really um, uh, thrive uh, in some of those uh, leading edge industries. You know, this, the work that we are doing in the administration is to try to um, help employers who are anticipating large demands for skilled workforces to anticipate those workforces and to put in place um, programs to help support them. And one of the things um, that we obviously, um, the president has a big focus on K through 14 education and really through PK uh, through 14 education. So, you know, his his thinking about uh, public education is to extend to earlier ages and to provide more um, access to uh, skilled and vocational training up to, um, you know, two years beyond college. And, you know, he's long been an advocate for free, you know, an additional free two years. Um, it's hard to get that funded. Um, but that can be towards an associate's degree that is a terminal degree or towards uh, the beginning of a four-year degree, depending. Um, there's also a lot of thinking and work with employers as well as with the labor department and local um, state uh, labor um, offices uh, to think about other pathways uh, that are not necessarily uh, for your college pathways starting as far back as high school. So, you know, we had a lot of career and technical education throughout the U.S., um, you know, several decades ago that kind of uh, that that um, really atrophied a little bit. And we're trying to build that back up so that people can go directly from taking those kinds of classes and getting credits in high school into um, a, a program that is connected to an employer where they get an additional two years, maybe with a community college and an employer, and then they go directly into jobs. So we're really thinking hard about that. But obviously, immigration is an is incredibly important part of the picture for the U.S. demographics. Um, I, you know, I think you know what the national debate looks like on that, but we're going to continue working hard um, to have a rational immigration policy that addresses those demographic challenges um, and so that the U.S. can continue to thrive. Thank you, Dr. Brenner. Willie? I think your hand is up. Willie Shu? Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brainer, for joining us, and thank you for the work you're doing. Uh, I had the opportunity to visit two of these uh, chip fab construction projects last year, last week, and they are truly massive in scale. But one of the notable uh, deficiencies in the supply chain is uh, those chips that are manufactured there. By and large, uh, a lot of the wafers are going to go overseas for packaging. And uh, I know there's a lot of angst about that, but I was just wondering your current thoughts on that packaging thing, because that's going to be a huge strategic vulnerability. Yep. So um, Chips and Science includes funding for advanced packaging as well. And I know that um, the NOFOs that um, the notice of funding opportunities that the Commerce Department has put out has included uh, welcoming applications for advanced packaging, both integrated with um, you know, some of the other fabrication um, investments, as well as standalone separate um, advanced packaging. There's also a real focus on uh, the advanced packaging piece in the R&D funding, in the you know, sort of research um, consortium that the government is going to work on with the private sector partners. So that's also um, uh, for the reason you said, uh, is also a, a, a important strategic focus um, for that collaborative uh, research portion of the chips and science um, programming. Yeah, because we're really behind in this country because we kind of gave that up, you know, five decades ago. And uh, so we don't have a lot of capability and you just don't see as much energy from the uh, business side, you know, potential partners putting energy into that 
as on the fab side. So thank you for that answer. Uh, Jean Soroka, Soroka, I think you have your hand up. Thanks, Ursula. Dr. Brainerd, Jean Soroka, Executive Director at the Port of Los Angeles. Appreciate your time today. A uh, couple things just to put on your radar and not necessarily needing an answer now, but halfway through the IIJA, California ports that account for about 40% of the nation's imports have received roughly 12% of the outlay from the IIJA. And while we're in lockstep with the administration on the decarbonization strategy here at the ports of LA and Long Beach, this is something that's baked into our fiscal and strategic plans. So I'd like to work with uh, your staff and you, we mentioned a Monica during the July call that this infrastructure money on both sides needs to have a unique focus here on the West Coast of the United States, not only based on what we saw during the pandemic, but the, uh, the individual plans that we have, whether it's decarbonizing uh, the trucking fleet, cargo handling equipment, and even now with the green corridors working on things like e-methane and e-methanol for the ocean-going uh, ships. So I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to take some time aside on that area. Uh, and again, just trying to get the American taxpayer the biggest return on their investment based on the cargo flows and the amount of impact that we have on the, uh, on the U.S. economy. Well, um, we certainly uh, are very uh, aware of uh, just uh, what share of the nation's uh, uh, ocean shipping uh, commerce goes through your ports. <laughs> we've, uh, we've we've been very focused on that. And so um, what I think we'll do is connect you to Mitch Landrieu, who is uh, running the implementation efforts for the IIJA. Um, to make sure uh, that he's uh, fully aware of the work that you're doing and, and you know, there's uh, that you're able to take advantage of the different parts of the IIJ that may be pertinent. So we'll we'll help make that connection. We've uh, we spent a lot of time with former Mayor Landrieu, um, new head of intergovernmental affairs, Tom Perez, who's also a friend, and Secretary Buttigieg over at Transportation. So probably need just a little bit different look and happy to talk to your staff and you offline. Okay. Okay. Happy to do that. Wonderful. Thank you, Stu. Stu Penn. You're on, you're on mute, Stu. I'm Stuart Pan. I'm an Intel's foundry business. You've met with a number of my colleagues over the last few weeks. I just wanted to make Willie aware that we have submitted a major uh, funding request to Commerce for a major packaging investment in New Mexico. So we are highly interested in uh, seeing that come through. And we are spending a, a lot of money throughout the United States in our research and development facilities to add packaging uh, into the mix in the U.S. So couldn't let one that one pass without at least commenting a little bit on it. So, I think I think you're allowed to talk about your your proposals, but I'm probably uh, you're not. not. <laughs> that, that's why I brought it up. <laughs> so. That's great. Thank you. Welcome. Right. Any other it's, questions? Go ahead, please. Well, I was just going to I was going to do the same, Ursula, and just ask if there are any other questions, and if not. Um, Let's see, it looks like there aren't any. I wanted to thank you again, Dr. Bernard, for your leadership and your focus on uh, these issues uh, with which we're chartered. Um, and thanks for spending time with our committee today. Thank you, and uh, thanks for taking time to be on this committee. We really appreciate uh, your uh, the, the time that you're spending and the insights you're bringing. So thank you. Thanks for your service. Um, now I'd like to uh, introduce Monica Gorman who's the Special Assistant to the President for Economic Development and Industrial Strategy on the National Economic Council. Prior to her appointment, um, uh, Monica worked for nearly two decades in the private sector, where, where she spent much of her time walking factory floors, Gemba walks, in the United States and around the world. Gorman served as an industry representative on Commerce's Industry Trade Advisory Committee on Textiles and Apparel, for more than a decade. She also has served lengthy tenures on the board of directors for the Fair Labor Association, the U.S. Footwear Manufacturers Association, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Cotton Board. In 2020, she was named a Presidential Leadership Scholar. 
She earned her BA from Dartmouth College and her master's degree in economics and a doctorate from the University of Oxford, England, where she was a Rotary Scholar. Uh, I'd like to introduce Monica Gorman. Great, thanks so much, Jeff. Um, and I'm gonna keep my remarks very brief. It's hard to follow Lael. I think you uh, got a good sense in terms of where we are as an NEC overall. Um, what I wanted to do is just make a few uh, maybe more technical comments on just some of the specific recommendations and how we are continuing to make progress on those. And then touch on something that Secretary Romano talked about, I know Grant talked about in terms of how we as a government are taking forward our work on supply chains. Because as we think about sort of the next phase of this work, I think that's where we would really appreciate your insights, your expertise to help inform how we take that forward. Um, but just specifically before we go into that, um, just I wanted to touch on a few additional recommendations that um, Lael didn't have time to go into. Um, this committee had recommended through the manufacturing subcommittee committee, um, the need to really protect the U.S.'s leadership position in synthetic and industrial biology. Um, we know that's an area where we uh, are really leading today, but we are at significant risk of potentially seeding that leadership. I know you're all aware of the executive order that the president signed almost a year ago now, and hopefully you had a chance also to look at the reports that were published last March at the six month mark of that executive order signing. Um, I wanted to let you all know, as we come up on the one year anniversary, there's gonna be more being published um, and sort of communicated by the agencies. Um, but there is going to be an industry day that DOD is holding on biomanufacturing on September 20th. I believe this was just announced. Um, so I wanted to put it on your radar screens. It's one example of how uh, we really are taking to heart the need to protect and advance US leadership um, in the bioeconomy and in biomanufacturing specifically. So just wanted to put that on everybody's radar screens. Writ large, with regards to the bioeconomy, again, we would we would welcome your thoughts as we have undertaken this as to whether or not the work that you see we're doing is really getting at that recommendation. Um, but it is something that there there's a significant amount a significant amount of work going on, not just within the executive office of the president, but really throughout the agencies. Um, just looking at some other. Why don't I pause there? I'm happy to talk on any specific recommendations if there's any any on your minds. Uh, so before I go into the sort of next phase of work, are there any questions that you have about specific recommendations that we haven't touched on yet? Any anything that I can answer there? Monica, one question that uh, comes to my mind um, in your in your work with uh, the subcommittees and uh, with Grant Harris and, and others in the Department of Commerce. Ha, have you, and, and especially as, as Grant and team think about the analytical capability that we'd like to develop and enhance so that the government is better prepared for um, the internal debate that it has to have as it sets policy if we encounter another disruption. Where, what's your point of view on, you know, at, as, you know, put an economist lens on where, where do we have the the kind of biggest holes in uh, the information that the government needed and would need again to uh, react uh, well to disruption? It's a great question. Um, I would say first and foremost, the missing link has been the analytical capability. So we have a great deal of information and data as a government. It's not sufficient in a number of areas. It's not granular enough, particularly if you're talking about specific changes in specific industries, but we do have a lot of data. Um, but prior to COVID, what we didn't have enough of and what commerce is really stepping in to address is the ability to view it from a supply chain lens and to think about the, the interconnectivity that is the supply chain, really supply network is probably a better term, and that changes in certain parts of the network that affect other aspects that may not be immediately visible. That was the capability that was just not really there in the way that we needed, and, and so we found ourselves scrambling to address it. Two years later, as we have worked to address, as the secretary said, reactively, um, we have learned a lot. And so from a White House perspective, we see that imperative now to take the learnings from 
the last two years and ensure that there is um, institutional muscle memory, uh, institutional capability, so that the next time it happens, and it will happen, there will be future disruptions, we are much more adept at recognizing patterns, uh, having playbooks uh, to use the lessons. They're never the same, but we will have actions that are tried and true that we can apply to them. Um, so I think that's that's probably the number one thing. Um, that said, actually, one of the questions I have for you all is when you think about the data collecting capabilities of the U.S. government, are there areas where you feel from a private sector lens that we should have more? Um, and then in what way would additional data in certain areas really then help to enable the private sector and companies to do their jobs more effectively? And so that these are... These are issues that we are working to tease out and would very much welcome feedback. Um, Tom, I see your hand up. I'll come to you in a second. I did, I did just want to note um, one of our other priorities here at the White House is looking across all of the agencies. I think this was also touched on earlier. Um, I actually wrote it down um, <laughs> in terms of the, the urge for us to ensure that there's coordination. Um, and I can tell you we really want to see all of the different supply chain efforts as being complementary. So commerce's um, leadership on analytics is key, but we mentioned the flow initiative. DOT has its new freight office. Um, that work is also key. In Within DOE, there's an entire new bureau that has been stood up. Um, there's the, the manufacturing and supply chain office within DOE that also coordinates with the other parts of DOE that have analytical capabilities and clean energy. And so, the, um, the, the opportunity ahead of us now is to harness all of this tremendous energy and tremendous investment that's been made and ensure that it is working together in a complementary and efficient fashion going forward. So let me pause there, Tom, I see your hand up. Yeah, great to see you again, Monica. And uh, I just wanna thank you for your support also of the, uh, the initiative to get together with the FDA and the round table that's being proposed. And I think it's gonna move forward. I think that's an important part of the information sharing and it also expands beyond just the, um, the biomanufacturing that you referenced, but also making sure that we have, of course, you can't deliver any of the biologic drugs without devices and making sure that we maintain uh, U.S. supply and kind of national security of those critical devices that you have to use to deliver basic health care as well. And so um, just to add that sometimes they get lost within the, the pharma space, but uh, just to make sure we keep those in there. And, and thank you for your support of that. Yeah, no, thank you, Tom. And as, as we've talked at length, um, it is crucially important and we, yeah. we appreciate the, the leadership you have in terms of maintaining the U.S. manufacturing of, of those crucial devices. So I'd be curious, I, mean, I think just to take to take the questions, um, are there initial thoughts? We can have some additional conversation, but if you do have initial thoughts on, on data where you feel the government is uniquely positioned, um, and you may not be seeing it today, but that it would be very helpful to you as a private sector from the supply chain resiliency lens and or what you would um, sort of ideally, how you would like us to work with the private sector. I think we would be interested in your thoughts. We are very cognizant of the fact that companies control supply chains, governments do not. Um, and so it's this um, unique nexus really of uh, public collection of data, but with sensitivity to, at the end of the day, supply chains are controlled by private companies. In the United States. In the United States, yes. <laughs> Any, Monica, um, um, uh, I can just make a few comments on the question on data and analytics in particular, is that I think the general challenge that the private sector faces is typically we're all in our own swim lanes and there's a lot of hesitancy to share the information across those swim lanes. Um, so finding those big fact patterns come together proactively and early enough sometimes becomes difficult to do because we're all kind of looking at our own data and not as end to end as we should be. And I think finding ways to bring that information together in the core, kind of the most vulnerable sectors, we talked about medical definitely being one of them, 
um, I think is is really important. Like we have been trying to have an independent conversation with um, you know companies across the electronics um, space to see if there's a way to stand up a third party data collection. Um, uh, group that really looks at this information and publishes it in so, some way that is independent of each of the individual companies that's providing the data. And um, it's it's making some progress, but it's always hard to do because everyone wants to protect their, their data and information. So, uh, you know, I feel like government is in the best position, particularly in core kind of the most vulnerable sectors to focus on end-to-end -end supply chain data that can come together in some cohesive way. And, you know, I think the part that I would be interested in, because I think somebody had mentioned it, maybe it was a grant at the beginning of the meeting, is that the objective of the supply chain center that's being set up is to focus on data and information around the core sectors. Um, so what, what are those core sectors? What is the way we can help, if any, you know, without really um, endangering anybody's focus on their own uh, data and their data privacy issues, I think would be helpful because at the end of the day, it all has to be about predictive analytics looking and really figuring out how, how you can see these things happen. I always worry that in this day of AI and all this, um, you know, predictivity that's there, you know, we didn't predict the supply chain crisis. We solved for it by the age old way of putting a lot of inventory in place um, and then create that, co that continuous supply demand imbalance that everybody has to work through. Uh, so I think understanding what those core sectors are that, you know, the supply chain center is looking to get information and how we can help with that, I think would be uh, very productive. Thank you. Stu? Uh, along those same lines, I'll talk to some of the true demand stuff that a uh, member of RevC staff is uh, promoting and we're actively involved. But I think, Monica, one of the key areas that as we were setting this particular group up was the legal interaction. Are we allowed to talk? When are we allowed to talk? What kind of data can we share? And for companies who have been under regulatory scrutiny, uh, including ours over the years, uh, it's important that we know the ground rules up front. And I think the more uh, the government can make those clear, this is areas that we're gonna actively encourage you to cooperate and practically say, hey, this is what you know crosses the line. This is what stays within the guardrails. It'd be good to know because the guardrails, I think, are now changing. You know, with the kind of things we're seeing in supply chain today, the need to collaborate is much higher, but there's still, you know, a lot of, we have these meetings, there's legal counsel meetings, right? And when you have legal counsel meetings, uh, people tend to get a little quieter. So I think having clarity on those rules would be very helpful in getting this set up. It's a very, very good point, Stu. And the banking industry, um, 10 years ago was faced with this similar issue on um, cybersecurity and a lot of data exchanges that needed to be in place for them to be resilient. And they seem to have worked through some of that. So maybe we can use that as a, as a test case or some kind of an example, because this, this ability to actually interchange or to intercommunicate data around in a legal framework is, believe it or not, a relatively big deal uh, to Stu's point. So I think thinking about that and how we can uh, promote communication in a way that's legally allowed is, is something that has to be addressed. That's a really excellent point. Thank you for raising that. And, and Ursula, thank you also for raising the banking uh, example. I think that's a really good case for us to dig into. Really appreciate everybody's thoughts. Well, I think if we there are no other questions for for Special Assistant Gorman, thank you so much uh, for being here and uh, for carrying quite a bit of weight. So thank you.